It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a Wisdom Wednesday presented by DraftKings, America's number one rated sports book app. Another ridiculous basketball offer this week for those guys. Just make sure you use the code Ross. Switching things up on you a little bit, keeping you on your toes. As you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. I am in a hotel room. This is my last morning in a hotel room. But because of that, We've got the GC, Greg Cosell, bright and early on a Wednesday morning, talking Julian Edelman, talking linebackers momentarily. We'll have Andrew Brandt later in the week, likely tomorrow afternoon, will be the last Ross Tucker football podcast. Make sure, by the way, you check out Scott Barrett on today's Fantasy Feast podcast because he had some fascinating nuggets when it comes to this year's wide receiver class. I mean, really top-notch stuff. And already tomorrow, I'll have a spread the word winner. I'm at Ross Tucker NFL. We are at Ross Tucker Pod. Please just do anything. Retweet, like, reply, quote, tweet. I see it all, and it all means a great deal to me personally when you guys do that. And a little tip, by the way, if you quote tweet, you get a real good chance of getting retweeted. If you quote tweet one of the shows, one of the posts about the shows, you get a real good chance of getting retweeted. I'm just saying, sponsor confirmation email winner as well. You guys know I'm looking for any of them. If you want to be in the next football feedback, that YouTube only show that people are really enjoying. Speaking of YouTube, I'll give that shout out winner tomorrow. All you have to do is subscribe to youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL and then comment on any of the videos. Great way, by the way. Yeah, either social or YouTube, great way to see the highlight clips of the other shows if you don't have a chance to watch or listen to the entire thing. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. Joins us every week. Um, I call him the civilian goat. I think he's the best that's ever done it in terms of breaking down the videotape. He'll be all over NFL matchup. You got some draft shows coming up, right, Greg? We do. We do two of them. Uh, Matt Bowen and I in Sal Palo are working on that now. They will air on the 21st and the 27th of this month, April, uh, on ESPN2. Uh, in the evening, I don't know the exact times, but the evening of the 21st and the 27th. And we do it a little differently. We don't just look at lists and say, here are the top five at this, here, here are the top five at that. We look at the NFL as the starting point and how the NFL game has tactically and thematically evolved, and we put players in the context of the NFL. I love it. I've, I watch it every year. Love it. It's awesome. Check out Greg on social media, at Greg Cosell. That way you never miss anything he does. Before we get to the linebackers today, Greg, there are a couple veteran players I wanted to ask you about. One is a guy that announced his retirement uh, Monday evening, Julian Edelman. Not going to get in the Hall of Fame debate because that's not what you do. What you do is tell us what the player was when you watched him over the course of his career. Well, maybe it's because of what I've done for years and the fact that I see the game tactically. I see the game um, in, in a sense the way it's coached because I've had the opportunity over the years to speak and get to know coaches. To me, what stands out about Julian Edelman is the way in which he played. His game was built on detail nuance, understanding. You know, it's easy to say, wow, he was clutch. Well, those things happen for a reason, Ross, as you know. You don't just go out there and say, I'm going to be clutch today. Those things happen because you work hard on all the little details of the game so that your execution is the same all the time. It's repetitive so that moments don't matter because your, your consistency of execution and the repetitive execution just happens because of the way you practice, the way you go about your craft. Football, any, any sport is a craft. And that, to me, is what stands out about Julian Edelman. That, that is interesting. I, I'll talk about it later. I think uh, when you said the way in which he played, 
I I feel like at times he almost played wide receiver like a linebacker, like we're talking about today, that, that position group, just in terms of the intensity, the ferocity. I thought Belichick made a good point when he talked about all the things Edelman can do. I mean, right. he kicks, he could play a little defense, he could throw the ball, he could run the ball. I mean, he was like a modern-day Jim Thorpe, right, on some level. But why could he do that? Why could he do that? Because that stuff comes from practice. It comes from commitment. You make a great point about the ferocity and the competitiveness. That's built into his DNA. That you would notice immediately when you put on tape, probably when he played in ninth grade. But I'm talking about the details of being a receiver. Uh, because obviously he was not a receiver in college. He was a, uh, he was a quarterback. So he had to learn how to play receiver. Think about learning a brand new position, Ross. You played in the league, okay? Think about learning a brand new position at the highest level of football and what that entails. That's a great point because I felt like I I felt like I learned a brand new position on the offensive line and I played it for 3 years in college. But right, it's right. so much more detailed and sophisticated at the professional level. That, when you when you put it that way, Greg, that's a really good point. Uh, so the other guy I wanted to ask you about, you know, I'm not sure what to think of him. And you've watched him a lot. He just signed with the Arizona Cardinals. James Conner, Greg, what do you see when you watch James Conner, the former Steeler running back? Yeah, he's been uh, – an enigma in just in terms of production and, and it's hard to know why he had a very nice three, four game stretch early in the 2020 season where the Steelers actually ran the ball. Yeah. I think he averaged 17, 18 carries a game for three, four, five weeks in a row. And it really looked like, Hey, not only was he a solid back, but that the Steelers would have a run game and then injury. What, what again, we're not there, but it, it didn't happen. And he sort of fell off the face of the earth and, and, it just didn't work out. So obviously the Cardinals needed a back to replace Kenyon Drake. Um, they're a passing team. They're a spread formation team for the most part, although they line up in a lot more of 12 personnel with two tight ends than people might think. Uh, and they needed a back. And I think Connor has a, has a pretty good skill set, not a special skill set, but I think in an offense like that, if they can develop the, the rhythm and continuity that they would like, I think he could carry 170, 180 times and be an effective player. I personally, and again, I'm going to talk about this later. I personally like the uh, him and Chase Edmonds together. Yeah. You know, they complement each other, I think, a little bit. We're talking linebackers today, Greg. We'll get into DBs next week. So I am not going to ask you whether or not linebackers matter or what. <laughs> Certain organizations put a lot of value and resources into it. Others don't. Different philosophies. The question I have for you, though, is why is a three-down linebacker so valuable? Well, the key, the key in today's NFL is you must be able to play in sub in order to be considered a high-level linebacker and a high-level linebacker prospect. Because that's the way the game is played, Ross. The game is played predominantly in sub from a defensive perspective. So what does that mean? When you evaluate linebackers coming into the NFL now, You ha they have to be able to move. They have to be able to close down space. They have to be able to play with range. They've got to be able to bend. They've got to be able to flow. They've got to be able to match up in man-to-man -man coverage. You've got to think about linebackers that way now. This is no longer a game. Now, I'm not saying these players have no value. They just don't have high value. This is no longer a game for 250-pound run-stuffing stacked backers. Um, yes, you're going to line up in your base. We know that. But now we're talking about the, the big term now that people talk about, value of position. But it's not – the value of the position comes from the way the NFL game is played. It's not just a random platitude in the statement. Oh, this position has no value. It's it's a function of the way the NFL game is played. And you're going to be in some form of sub in defense, meaning 5 DBs, 6 DBs, probably 70% or more of your snaps. There were teams that played in sub over 80% of their snaps last year. So that's how you have to start with linebackers now. 
Well, and let's start with the linebackers with Micah Parsons from Penn State. He's a guy, Greg, I, I saw his third high school football game ever, and I was blown away when he was in ninth grade. He was a defensive end, extremely impressive. What did you see on tape from Parsons? Well, now he's an interesting guy as well because <clears throat> you talk about defending the pass. He was a defensive end, as you said, and there were schools, colleges that recruited him as a defensive end, not as a linebacker. And obviously he went to Penn State and played linebacker. And you're dealing with a high-level traits player. You know, he's not a tough evaluation. You know, he's not one of those guys in, in the scouting business. People are going to say, gee, I'm not sure what he is. I mean, this guy has great play speed. He's got sideline to sideline range. He can play both on and off the ball. He'll take on blocks in the run game. He he can rush the quarterback in your sub, as we just said. Um, what I really liked about his 2019 tape, because obviously he opted out of 2020, is despite the great athleticism, he was always under control and compact in his movement, but he was explosive and sudden. Um, and I think he struck me, and, and he's bigger and, and overall better, but I think of the way the Tennessee Titans use Rashawn Evans, where he's a linebacker in their in kind of their base. Base can also be nickel these days. Um, but then when they go into their their true sub, which is dime, Evans is kind of a wild card pass rusher. And I think Parsons has the ability to be that kind of player where he can truly be an off-the-ball linebacker, but depending on your personnel, game situation, he can also be an on-the-ball rusher or a blitzer. Um, he's He can play multiple roles in your sub defense, and he's an explosive sudden athlete. You know, it's interesting, Greg, because we were talking about Edelman and switching positions. You know, I don't think people realize hand in the dirt defensive end to off the ball backer. Those are totally different worlds. Totally. He's totally. totally and, I, and I'm impressed. I, I guess my point would be when he gets more reps and just sees things more, I really think the sky is the limit for him because he's only been an off the ball backer twice, you know, for two years of his whole life. Right. And it's just a different, it's a different vantage point, different blocking schemes coming at you. You see it differently. It, yeah. Oh my gosh. It's, it's so different. So I think that's a real feather in his cap. Um, the other linebacker that's getting a lot of attention, Greg, uh, is Jeremiah, uh, Owusu, is it Koromoa? I don't know. Koromoa, yeah. Yep. Uh, Koromoa from Notre Dame, who's a little different. He's listed at 215. He's not 245 like Parsons. Well, he came in at 221 in his pro day, which tells me he wants to be a linebacker because he essentially plays – he looks like a safety when you get right down to it. I mean, so the fact that he came in at 221 in his pro day tells me he wants to be a linebacker. Now, you're talking about a kid with – incredible explosive movement traits. I mean, he is long, rangy, sudden, explosive. He is a dynamic mover. I think, look, everybody gets caught up, and it happened with Isaiah Simmons last year. Totally different body type, obviously, but the point I'm making is this. People get caught up in thinking, well, he's going to come in the NFL and play five positions. No, he's not. That's not going to happen, and it's certainly not going to happen right away. Um, but I think he's the kind of guy that – He's not a stacked backer in my view. I don't care what he came in at and weighed. He's not a true stacked backer. He's much more of a space player. So if you see him as a backer, he's kind of an overhang player, meaning he lines up just outside the box. Um, he really has safety traits. Um, but he matched up to wide receivers, slot wide receivers. He matched up to tight ends. Uh, he's a terrific athlete, and he is truly shot out of a cannon. The player I thought of watching him, and I'm and I, I, I I'm wondering how teams see him. I thought of a Derwin James kind of comparison. Um, I think this kid's a little more purely explosive than James. James might have been a better overall prospect coming out, but I think in in the way you he can be deployed, I thought of a Derwin James. Interesting, really interesting. What about Zaven Collins? 
from Tulsa. Yeah, well, he's he's a little different cat because he's 6'4", 259. He might even be closer to 6'5". I mean, this kid is a big dude, and, and he looks big. I mean, when you put the tape on, you go, wow, that's a big dude. Yeah, he's 6'5", actually. 6'5", 259. Um, now, he's not twitchy, you know, and obviously he doesn't have – you know, loose hips, but he's very athletic in a straight line, and and he played in multiple spots. I think his game as, as an edge pass rusher ha- can be developed. I think you could eventually see him being used that way in sub defenses. He's he's still kind of working on that. Um, I think, you know, I saw him. It, it, it's in some ways just so people get a visual picture. I saw him as a guy you could use in multiple ways. He's multi-positional. Think of when Kyle Van Noy was with the Patriots and how they used him, and now he's back with the Patriots. Um, he even kind of reminded me of Fred Warner coming out of BYU because people may not know when Fred Warner, who's become a great stack backer, obviously, um, when Fred Warner came out of BYU, he played almost like an overhang. He played over the slot. He played stacked. He played in multiple spots in college and obviously with the Niners and he's one of the three or four best linebackers in the league, but he's predominantly a stack backer. But um, the thing about Collins is despite his size, the one thing you could say he lacks is he's not an overly physical player. Despite his size, he plays far more like an athlete and a mover than he does a purely physical player. That's interesting. Um, there are some other guys. I'll give you one who's one of my absolute favorites. Well, I was going to give you like three or four and let you pick. I'm guessing he's one of them, so go for it. Well, who are you going to give me? Let's let's see if uh, – because, you know, I want people need to understand you don't give me lists here. You know, we just do this off the cuff. So who are you going to throw out? Well, so, I, you know, we usually try to keep it to about 20 minutes. So the, guy, the other guys I have on my list would be Nick Bolton uh, from Missouri, Jamin Davis, Kentucky – Jabril Cox, LSU, Baron Browning, Ohio State, Chaz Surratt, North Carolina. Any of those guys jump out? Oh, yeah, you? yeah. The guy I'd love to talk about is Jamin Davis. Jamin Davis I knew nothing about when I put on the tape. I watched him probably six, seven weeks ago. You know, And, and it's so funny how this works. Six, seven weeks ago, no one talked about him at all. And then all of a sudden in the last two weeks, I see, well, he's moving up the list. He's not moving up lists. It's just that – more people in the NFL level are seeing him, coaches. So he's not moving up. Um, I watched him about six, seven weeks ago, and I love this guy's tape. I think he's one of the most intriguing linebacker prospects. He was one of my favorites to evaluate. This kid has size, length, play speed, range, coverage ability. Um, The more I watched him, the more I felt that his combination of length and play traits, he transitions beautifully as a three down backer. Now that may not happen week one of this season. We don't know, you know, we're still unfortunately in a little, in a pandemic world. We have no idea about that, but it will happen. I mean, you're talking about a long, fluid, rangy, explosive athlete. He just the way we started this, he can close down space. He can play with range. He's willing to take on blocks uh, in the run game. Um, I, I think this kid really has high level traits for the NFL linebacker position. Yeah, it's weird. Somebody, I think I read somewhere, Greg, where the the NFL advisory or maybe his coaches told him he was like, might not even get drafted or was like a fourth or fifth round pick or something crazy. Yeah, well, you know, then coaches get involved because, you know, what people have to understand is the NFL process. Coaches don't get involved in this process until usually after the combine. This year there was no combine. So because they're doing free agency. So what happens is guys that that are not well known, like Jamin Davis, you know, a lot of the the draft people uh, who do this, they don't, they're uh, familiar with them, but they don't know where to put these guys. And then all of a sudden, coaches get involved and they realize, wow, these guys are thought of pretty highly. And then they say, well, they're moving up. They're not moving up. It's just the people who make the decisions are getting around to really studying them in detail. Anybody else worth mentioning, well, Greg? We mentioned Warner, Nick Bolton. Surratt. Brown. I love Chase Surratt, but I want to mention Nick Bolton because I think he's going to be a fascinating case study for this reason. Okay. Nick Bolton is a really good player in certain ways. There's not a lot of mystery to what he is. He's a classic run and hit stacked linebacker. He plays with high level competitiveness. He's got tremendous energy. He's got great play recognition and reaction, and he's got a quick explosive trigger. He reacts. He's a box player. Now, he's 5'11", 
So now you have to decide, can this guy play in your sub? Is he going to match up man to man to, you know, whether they're, it's a really good back, he's not going to match up man to man to big time tight ends. So what is Nick Bolton? He's a re- like I said, there's no mystery. And what he is, he's really good at. But you have to decide, it, can he play in your sub? Now, he's a pretty good blitzer. They did use him that way at times. So maybe he can. But I think he'll be a fascinating case study because there's no question that the tape shows a really good player at what he is. It's just, does he fit the sub game? And if he doesn't fit the sub game, in your mind, as a team, then no matter how good he is playing in the box as a stack backer, is he a high-value draft choice? And, you know, that that becomes team and, and scheme-specific. Greg, we'll talk DBs next week. Fantastic stuff, as always. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Ross. Really appreciate it. At Greg Cosell, a man, by the way, that's been married a long time. And you know what you should do, Greg? You should get yourself a new wedding band. Manly bands here to rescue you from an otherwise hellish band buying experience. If you're a young guy or someone looking to get married for the first time, totally get it. You're all worried about cut, clarity, carrot, color for your fiance. God, or even not fiance, before you even buy it for her. What about you though, man? You deserve an awesome wedding band. I got one. These things are awesome. And they make it so much easier than the process back in the day. Plus, people like, you know, Greg and me, we deserve to have a second wedding band. You know, maybe one you put on when you're working out. Maybe one you put on when you go out. Something nicer. Because the one that I wear when I work out all the time is kind of beat up. They got all kinds of different materials that you can choose from. Gold, wood, antler, steel. It's really pretty cool when you think about the different types of bands they have, to order your Manly Band and get 21% off, plus a free silicone ring, go to manlybands.com slash Ross. That's manlybands.com slash Ross for 21% off. Manly Bands, the best darn rings, period. Tux Takes. Morning, Russell. Let's start with the Edelman retirement news. You think he's definitely done, and do you think he's going to wind up in Canton? I do think he's done because I think his body. I, I just I, I don't think he's one of those guys going to come back and sign with the the Bucks. I don't see it. I don't think he will be in the Hall of Fame. You know, the debate is really a pretty interesting one, right? It's how much do you value postseason? And I, obviously, we all value postseason, but compared to compiling stats during the regular season. So, if you heavily weight Super Bowls and postseason, then you think Edelman's a Hall of Famer. If you think, well, look, that's uh, on some level a function of the team around you, we got to go more by what they did during the regular season, then you don't think he's a Hall of Famer. I'll say two things, Bri, about Edelman. Number one, I don't think he has a compelling argument to get in the Hall of Fame before guys like Torrey Holt or Reggie Wayne. I just don't. I don't think he's got a great argument there. Those guys won Super Bowls, et cetera. However, Julian Edelman, one of my top five favorite wide receivers ever. I loved the way that guy played football and being one of my top five wide receivers ever is a much more exclusive club in the hall of fame. So congratulations, Julian, you made it to a more exclusive club than the pro football hall of fame. Tux takes. Some good topics for Andrew Brandt tomorrow, Ross, but uh, want to get your thoughts on the NFL's memo regarding vaccine requirements to interact with players. Yeah. So, Uh, This makes sense. If you're going to be a tier one or tier two employee, which is like an athletic trainer or a coach or whatever, you're going to be around the players. To be around the players, you have to get the vaccine. 
it's interesting because evidently the players don't have to, but to be around the players, you do. I think the players, they obviously, everything they do is collectively bargained, not the case with the team employees. But you're right, this will be a good topic for Andrew. Tux Takes. Another good topic for Andrew. Uh, Broncos and Steelers being the first teams to publicly declare that they're not going to show up for the offseason program that starts on Monday. Yeah, Broncos and Seahawks. And it's actually uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have said the same thing as well. I don't really understand this, and I don't really agree with it. So, first of all, the program is voluntary. So, if you don't want to go, then don't go. The only thing that's mandatory is the one mini camp. So I don't know why they have to issue statements that we will not we will not be attending. Blah blah blah. I, I'm not really sure why that is, Bry, that they're doing that, but that's what they're doing. Also, I kind of liked going back in the off season. I mean, I thought it was a better environment with which to work. I like the free breakfast and lunch. You get, I don't know, 200 bucks a day to work out. It's extra money that's not part of your contract. I would have a problem. I mean, if I was one of these guys making millions a year, I think I get it. But if it was like how I was as a player or if I was a young guy, I wouldn't I wouldn't be real happy about this. I, I don't know that I would go along with it. Tux takes. Got some running back news today. Giovanni Bernard signs with the Tampa Bay Bucks, And as you and Greg discussed, James Conner, now an Arizona Cardinal. Right. I think I like Conner. I, I, I will say this about Conner. You know, this notion I read from Ian Rappaport, okay, that one of the reasons why Conner took so long to sign, Bry, is because he had turf toe surgery this offseason. Well, the notion that you know, Connor had surgery, but it was a moderate case of turf toe. Guys don't have surgery for a moderate case of turf toe. I just don't believe that. So I'm not buying that. I do like the fit, though, with the Cardinals, with him and Chase Edmonds. I think they do complement each other pretty well. As for Giovanni Bernard, boy, it sounds like the Buck, the Bucks really like to make sure they have a bunch of running backs. But Bernard really good on third down. You know, not really Ronald Jones thing. Fournette, not his specialty. I guess the Bucks tried to get James White for this role, but instead they'll get Bernard. And, you know, they, they want a guy that's very reliable on third down. Tux takes. And finally, uh, the Bengals claim tight end Thaddeus Moss off waivers and former Chiefs coach Britt Reed been charged with the DUI in connection with that accident prior to the Super Bowl. Thaddeus Moss, of course, the son of Randy Moss. So he always gets attention when there's a move surrounding him. As for Britt Reed, I, I guess I read Bry his the blood test they did, his blood alcohol was 0.13 or whatever over the legal limit. Just an awful, awful situation all the way around. First and foremost, for that family. That was involved in that young girl. Uh, you know, I can't even go there mentally, obviously. Having two girls of my own, just cannot even imagine. And then, frankly, you know, it's been a tough road for Andy Reid with his children. Obviously, his other son um, had the issue at Eagles training camp. I was actually there that day when that happened. Just very, very difficult very difficult and there's no good way to transition so i will just tell you guys that fantasy feast today will be awesome we already recorded it please check out today's fantasy feast scott barrett is an absolute stud and then i got to give shout outs because we've got our i think we're done here members of patreon.com slash rt media like pizza boy brewing sportaculture vision comics with an x and humanheadnyc.com. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feasts, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.
A lot of times on the show, I mention DraftKings. Here's what you need to know. You got to be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 100Gambler or in Indiana, 109WITHIT. By the way, if what I was talking about included a deposit bonus, doesn't always. Sometimes it does. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough, and deposit bonuses are paid out in site credit. 